Uh, <laughs> all right, welcome to the Jibs Podcast, guys. We've got a really exciting episode here today. Um, I got Tim and Nicole with me from Detroit Hives. Uh, Detroit Hives is an organization that is uh, basically building advocacy towards the uh, protection of bees. Um, because there is like a declining bee population, uh, like worldwide, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so let's let's just get into it. Uh, do you guys kind of want want to tell me who you guys are, uh, your background, and then kind of what Detroit Hives even is? Okay, I'll kick it off. My name is Timothy, and I'm a creative, a visionary, as well as the director of Detroit Hives. And Detroit Hives is a nonprofit organization whereby. Our, our mission is to transform vacant lots into urban bee farms, mm-hmm. not only for the conservation and education of honeybees, but also to help spread bee awareness. Yeah. So my name is Nicole uh, Lindsay, and I'm the co-founder of uh, Detroit Hives. Mm-hmm. Um, and he basically <laughs> said <laughs> um, everything, like what we're about and what we do. Cool. So yeah. what, what made you guys want to start Detroit Hives? Great question. Um, I think it all started with learning about the power of honey and its medicinal properties. Um, I was dealing with a, a illness, and I was um, I was dealing with an illness, and someone referred me to consume some local raw honey, mm. and I tried it, and it seemed to work for me, and it worked really well. And I was intrigued by the properties and how it was able to heal me. That inspired me to learn more about honey, and that led me to learn more about honeybees. And then learn more about honeybees and how important they are to our environment and that they already are in a state of declination. Mm-hmm. It inspired us to act and create Detroit Hives, which is transforming yeah. vacant lots and the bee farms. Yeah. So where did you guys do your first project or what are some of your current projects? Awesome. Uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, currently our um, farm is at uh, East Warren. Well, it's 9336 East Warren. Yeah. Um, and across the street is McCullen. Um, so that's our first uh, property where we have our hives at. Um, and currently, we have three hives yeah. on that property. Yeah. We started with ten thousand. We started with uh, thirty thousand honeybees, and at the end of the harvest season, we reached around at least a quarter of a million. That's two hundred fifty thousand oh, honeybees, yes. which is what? very impressive. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And but before we got to the vacant lot, uh, it was definitely loaded with types of trash, debris, tires. It was considered an eyesore for the community. Right. So one thing that we, we first started was, you know, is cleaning up the area mm-hmm. and making it uh, pleasable for the people around in the community. So, okay, where, do, where does somebody even start? Like, where do you get the hives from? Where do you get the bees from? How do you learn to even harvest these? Well, we, well to a beginner, what we first did was search for beekeeping courses in Michigan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we were referred to several beekeeping courses in several organizations one being the Southeastern Michigan Beekeepers Association, and they referred us to two other uh, bee courses, one in Royal Oak with Green Toe Gardens mm-hmm. and another in Detroit with Sweet on Detroit. Mm-hmm. So we took two beekeeping courses um, last year, finished those courses, and then we learned everything about where to purchase hives, where to purchase bees, and how to care for bees. Mm-hmm. So we, we took the courses and went straight into action. And we have now, you know, we have yeah. our bees still doing good. Mm-hmm. They made it over the winter. Yeah. yeah. They're still fighting through. So yeah. we're looking forward to a great spring. That's what I've seen. Are bees really resilient in the wintertime? Or... Yeah, they can, they can <laughs> yeah. survive in the um, wintertime. What they do is they cluster up into like a ball inside of the hive and they keep mm. like a 98 degree temperature in there. Um, so they're constantly mm. like buzzing and giving off heat to yeah. keep the queen warm and the hive going. And what people don't know is bees can tolerate cold weather, Mm -hmm. but one thing they can tolerate is cold, wet moisture. So in the the winter, they will form a cluster of 98 degrees, but sometimes you may have condensation inside the hives. So how humans and bees work together in the winter to make sure they survive is that we ventilate the hives, we properly ventilate the hives, um, and then we add wood chips into the hive so we can absorb the moisture. And we add we drill holes into the hive as well, yeah. so that there's some airflow going through the hive. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So when you build these things out, from the time you guys started until now, how many bee stings have you guys? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll kick it off. I've only been stung three times, yeah. and out of those three times, I've been stung in the second worst place a male can be stung at. Oh. And that was in the upper lip, but yeah. I've only been stung three times. 
But <laughs> one great thing about getting stung by a honeybee is that it's actually works through a process called apitherapy. Okay. Mm-hmm. And apitherapy is when a honeybee releases its venom into you. You receive benefit. You receive uh, medicinal properties, mm-hmm. benefits. So honeybees more so will pollinate from flowers like kale, tomatoes, our fruits and our vegetables. Mm. And they're made up of all those great things. So when they sting you, they release those antibiotics and those great properties inside of you as well. Yeah. Opposed yeah. to more opposed to yellow jacket wops. Oh, Je- yellow jackets are scavengers. So they love to they love to be around dead carcass. They eat honeybees. They're around flies. They're around trash. They're more so around junk food mm-hmm. opposed to honeybees. So when you get some with a yellow jacket, that's what most people are really allergic to. Mm-hmm. They're more so allergic to the different types of things that the yellow jacket lands on or that's uh, consuming yeah. on this diet. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've been stung four, four times. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, I've been stung under my arm. Um on the side of my face. Yeah. <laughs> um, where else have I been stung? Yeah, I've been stung multiple times. So I was the first to get the that's, most um, oh, yeah. thing. And a lot of times when we get stung, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're probably just not wearing protection, protective right. gear. Right. Mm-hmm. And we feel that comfortable with the bees. And sometimes the bees may feel a little scared or, or nervous, but we try mm-hmm. to make sure that, you know, the bees are feeling more safe. So. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I, mm-hmm. I think that there's a, a huge stigma against bees, right? That a lot of people are scared of uh, these creatures uh, mm-hmm. unnecessarily so because they're not really aggressive, right? Yeah. Uh, and people get them mixed up with wasps or yellow jackets, like you were talking about. Yeah. Can you kind of explain to people what the difference between a honeybee is and a wasp, and how they can tell the differences and what they should look for? Good. Okay. Okay. Um, so, like with a honeybee, it looks more like it's like a honey-colored um, insect. Right. So it's, it has a little more fur on it. Um, You'll see them more so in flowers and in your gardens. Um, but with yellow jackets, they're slimmer. They don't have like, they have hair, but it's very, very little. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're bright yellow and black. Um, and those are the ones when you're at your picnics or you're at the apple orchard and they're all in your sugary drinks, they're in your foods, they're the more aggressive ones. Mm-hmm. Um, so you don't want to swat at those because they're going to come and sting you. Yeah. <laughs> and and then like, go ahead. one great thing about the two is that um, a yellow jacket can sting humans over and over again. Right. And that's because they have a stinger that's, they have a straight um, shaped stinger yeah. and honeybees they can only sting you once because their stinger is, has a curved shape mm-hmm. and it tends to get stuck into our elastic skin yeah. mm-hmm. and when it gets stuck in the skin it really it rips apart of their body of, you know yeah uh, their stinger is attached to the intestine so when it's um, inside of us it just pull pulls it out a part of them yeah and pull a part of them out and the reason why I get stuck in our skin because our skin is thicker yeah. um, than any other um, it has the elastic yeah, texture. Yeah, and it's just yeah. thick. But they can stink like animals and other insects multiple times, just not us. Yep. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that's good to know. And then also, yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember. Like, I used to be really scared of bees. And mm-hmm. uh, I never really knew the difference. Like, we had this huge wasp at our house, huge wasp yeah. nest at our house. And, right. like, I mean, you end up just like spraying chemicals on it and yeah, trying and to try and get rid of it, which doesn't really work. It doesn't. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, and once again, a lot of people confuse wasps with bees. Yeah, yeah wasps and bees them, are yes. two different species. There are over yeah. nine thousand species of bees, and wow. ten uh, out of the nine thousand, ten make up a family. There's ten families, okay. and one of the families, the Apidae family, and that's the family that consists of honeybees, yeah. bumblebees, and stingless bees. Yeah. Oh, wow. So there's yeah. so many types of species of bees that, you know, people may not know or may not come across, but they're most commonly uh, misrepresented with yellow jacket wasps. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then another characteristic of um, yellow jackets is that when you see the nest, it looks like a paper mache like nest. Mm. Those are wasps. Honey bees, you'll see like honeycomb, or you see them like on a oh, cluster yeah. Yeah. where they're um, all out, maybe on a tree or maybe inside of a tree. But you'll see the honeycomb. Yeah. Uh, but the wasps have like that paper mache type of nest. It yeah. looks like a mummified yeah, type yeah. of nest that people see, and they might get those um, confused. <laughs> okay. uh, 
Another thing I was reading about is that, you know, there were a lot of beef farms in the early 30s and 40s mm -hmm. in Detroit, yeah. right. and that kind of went in a decline. Uh, like, worldwide bees are declining for various reasons, but, like, in Detroit, it was because of, like, uh, people were, like, taking their weeds away or a lot of, like, the pollution, mm -hmm. right? Is that Was that the reasoning or what? Um, I think because I as think the city was building, you had yeah. city ordinances, yeah. and it was more so something that was heavily populated in rural areas. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I, and I think another reason why it kind of changed over is because we were becoming more industrial right. and we were, um, you know, changing over from more so farming and going into more the industrial car mm -hmm. industry. So that kind of just got lost in like transition. And then, um, you there's know, there's not like enough land on. and space for it. Yeah. Right. You know, there's, <laughs> there's not enough land and space. So it, it went mostly to rural populated areas. Yeah. You know, so, but now we have a ton of land. Yeah. A ton of, a lot of space to do but these things. What's yeah. more unique about urban beekeeping opposed to rural beekeeping um, is that our honeybees have a variety of wildflowers to pollinate from. Mm -hmm. Opposed to most rural areas, there's large crop fields. And they kind of get tired of pollinating from the same crop. Yeah. But here in the, in the urban city, we also have chemical-free land, free from herbicides, free from pesticides and GMO harmful sprays where our bees can pollinate in vacant lots that haven't been tap tapped or harmed with any chemicals. Right, right. So, okay, I guess on that note, uh, if bees are pollinating from plants that have been touched by chemicals, right, mm -hmm. does that affect the honey that comes out? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. What bees do is they will fly to a, up to a six mile radius and they're looking for great pollen and nectar sources. Right. And they'll extract the pollen from the hive, I mean, I'm sorry, from the from the flower, and then take that back to the hive. Right. And all the the bees will feast, and they'll eat off that pollen source. And that pollen may be contaminated with weed killer or some type of herbicide, mm -hmm. and then take on that chemical, and that can kill off the hive. But it also goes into our honey. So we also consume. Many people are maybe unfortunately consuming um, honey that's been contaminated with weed killer, herbicides, or pesticides. So that plays a, a big impact on our health as well. So how do we as consumers tell the difference? How do we get real honey with real benefits? That's mm -hmm. tough, but I've noticed lately that some um, some honey company jars they're they're labeling their honey as chemical, they're labeling honey as uh, GMO or herbicide or, or pesticide free honey. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I've you know what I've also noticed is that uh, so my family they live out in like Washington Township, so like. 30 mile almost mm -hmm. and we'll get our honey from like some of the Amish farms that are out there mm -hmm. and the honey from their farms tastes significantly different and like better Absolutely. than honey from the store that's store. like processed yeah because um, a lot some of the uh, honey that's in the stores now um, mm -hmm. are mixing just a little bit of honey and high fructose corn syrup oh, and then yeah. it's kind of making something that's like honey um but it's best to like you said you getting somebody honey from somebody that you know you mm -hmm. know that they have um like their farm is out you know in a chemical free environment um that is local um, it's definitely game. it's definitely important to buy yeah. and support local honey yeah. Yeah. Uh, honeybees create uh, what we call is immunotherapy through their products right and they they go from flower to flower in your local environment and they extract that pollen that we that dandelion that most people are allergic to mm -hmm. and they take that pollen back into their hive yeah. and by consuming it you it's kind of help expose your body to those elements that trigger your allergies and that's how you boost your immune system through the power of immunotherapy oh wow mm -hmm. yeah i mean i i feel like honey is a superfood like most it of is. Them. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's the it is. honey bees are the only insect that will provide food for humans yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. And honey <laughs> never goes old. It never it, it never expires, it never does. So mm -hmm. you can have a uh, honey forever to the to the test of time. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So like, okay, I live I live in Detroit. Okay. Where should I go to get my honey? You need to get it from Detroit hives. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> how, how would I, where do I go? Where do I go right yeah. now, unfortunately, we are completely sold out, but we are. Yeah. And we are preparing for our season for 2018. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 
we are working with companies like the Eastern Market okay. and Nine and Hilton Market in Ferndale. Okay. And we will be selling our honey online at DetroitHives.com. All right, cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, urban gardening is becoming very popular. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are growing their own food sources because they realize there's a lot of benefit in growing your own food mm-hmm. because a lot of times, again, you don't know where your food's coming from, the pesticides, the chemicals, right. and all that stuff, right? Uh, it, is there a benefit in the regular person learning how to keep a beehive uh, farm in their backyard? Absolutely. If they're really passionate about um, helping bees and learning more about bees, I would say they would have to definitely invest in learning or going to a beekeeping course. Yeah. And getting, you know, to get over that fear because it's definitely a fear of your first time learning about bees and learning how to care for them and not trying to have them get upset and just learning how to be gentle with them. Yeah. 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 But bees can help boost your, your food population. Yeah. It increases uh, your yield. Oh, does it really? Yes. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It intensifies your, your crops. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's cool. Uh, so... I mean, one thing is, is that, you know, uh, a lot of people are doing amazing projects like this, right, in Mm -hmm. the city. Uh, But if, uh, like, the youth in the city and the youth in, like, Metro Detroit don't learn more about what's happening or buy into and take interest in what's happening, then a lot of these things will die, right? So how do we engage a lot of our youth uh, and get them involved in things that are happening and how do we get them interested in these type of things? Great question. Well, I'll kick it off like this. Yeah. One of our missions is to help spread bee awareness. Okay. And in 2017, we created Bemoji. That's an emoji sticker app. And this is a cool app <laughs> in which we want to reach out to millennials and yeah. children to kind of create a cool way of introducing or raising bee awareness to them. Right. Where they can send cool little stickers of bee-related themes to their friends and family or fellow beekeepers. Mm-hmm. So one way is we, sometimes we create directly, way, directly or indirectly ways to raise bee consciousness. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, and then also another thing that we're doing, um, when we go into the schools and we educate them yeah. about beekeeping and how important the bees are, mm-hmm. um, we're spreading that awareness and we're getting them um, curious about bees and they want to learn more. Yeah. Um, so that's also sparking their interest when we come to the schools and we show them yeah. um, and teach them about beekeeping and bees. Yeah. And then also how you how you teach or being related, being, having Having topics that's more relatable to the to the children. Mm-hmm. So sometimes, um, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh gee, okay. Oh man, I don't know why I just froze. Oh up. yeah, just being related, relatable to kids, and yeah. you know, we come through and we tell them, oh, you know, our beehive is like not too far from yeah. the school and. You know, they know um, a lot of information and stuff that's going on with the bees. So when we come there and explain more and they are all in and interested and want to come out and help right. and yeah. be keep and all of that. And the children are so excited about the different job responsibility, job responsibility of different bees. There's yeah. so many different types of bees and their job duties. Yeah, you know. inside the hive. So they, a lot of them don't know that like mostly all the bees that work inside the hive are female. So yeah. that's one like with the girls like <laughs> yeah <laughs> that well, sparks well, there. All the bees you, that work inside the hive are female, and right. the males don't do any work. So that thing does. <laughs> we, we offer interesting ways to educate yeah. the children where it's not yeah. a traditional book format. Yeah. I mean, yeah. make it more interactive and hands on. So sometimes we bring in some beekeeping tools, or we'll take them to the hive where you can get hands on. There's no other places in Detroit where you can actually go to a a bee farm and see the bees and see them actually working, and actually taste live yeah. honey tastes from the hive. Yeah. There's no other place like that in Detroit that I know of so far. So yeah, well, they, well, we have a place where people can come and we can provide tours and education and hands-on experience. Um, we're yeah. working inside highs and learning more about the bees. I think that that helps spread the importance of why we need bees when they come mm-hmm. and actually see the bees working mm-hmm. and everything and how it works in a hive. I think that's beautiful. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I want to. I want to come by the farm and oh, yeah. I want to volunteer as well. Yeah. Uh, so just a few more questions. One question I I ask everybody on this podcast because this is uh, Detroit centered. We're focusing on like Detroit entrepreneurs, things that are happening in Detroit. But like, why Detroit? What makes it so special? Why Why would you even do this thing here? Mm. Well, first, because we was born and raised here. We yeah. see what's going on. 
um, in the community. We see what's going on with the vacant lots inside the inner city. Yeah. So we wanted to we wanted to activate those vacant spaces. And when we learned about what was going on the bees, we was like, okay, this is a great thing that we should do and put it in the inner city um, and spread more awareness about what's going on with the bees. Yeah. Um, and we want to help. And we see that, you know, all this vacant land and how all these great flowers that we have popping up in this and the vacant lots are really great for the bees and also that with these bees we're, they're also helping those surrounding urban gardens in the neighborhood mm-hmm. so why Absolutely. not why not Detroit we were born and raised we see what's going on um, we wanted to make a change yeah. absolutely yeah. especially with the uprise with urban agriculture so yeah Definitely plays an impact. You can't have a yeah. with all these urban gardens you're gonna need something to pollinate, pollinate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, are you guys doing anything at the farm now? Or are not just cold? Um, we just right check now. on them every now and then. Yeah. Um, we just had some warm days uh, that just can't that went by last week, and we checked on them, opened up the hive, and they're still in that buzzing, which is impressive. Amazing. Yeah, it was cold. There's no blanket in there, man. <laughs> That's, a, that's amazing. Yeah. How they can just hang on yeah, tight, like, negative degree weather. Right. It's tough. We got some tough bees. We do. A lot of bees, bees. ain't making yeah. it. A lot, of, a lot of beekeeping bees haven't made it yeah. through that winter. Because, wow. for one, I think we probably should have talked about it, the fluctuation of temperatures. Mm-hmm. They don't know if it's right now. They don't even know if it's spring or spring coming or if it's winter. It's like one minute it's 40 oh, degrees. And yeah. then yeah. Yeah. So they're chilling, like, okay, we're about to eat some of this food. Yeah. And then when they eat the food, it can just go down to a negative degree temperature. So yeah. that, that inconsistency is, is a real big problem with these insects. It's problems. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's, really, yeah. it's pretty yeah. bad. <laughs> it needs to be consistent. They need to know when the winter is here so they can continue that DNA pattern. If they keep having an inconsistent DNA pattern, they don't know when to pollinate or when to hibernate, you know? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, maybe, I, I don't know where the farm is or how it's set up, but it's are there like bee houses where it regulates the temperature to go with the seasons? No, but we are working on something like, like that that to provide shelter. We are also going into the real estate aspect and to create um, to purchasing abandoned homes to place bees in. Bees in the trap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would love to have a home that can serve as a conservation. Board it up and just place bees in there. You know, there's sometimes where honeybees will take into a home and they go into a wall. But with these homes, we pretty serve as a conservation. We're not trying to pull honey. We just want mm-hmm. bees to thrive. Okay. You know, if there's in a the wall or if they're in the floor, just let them yeah. do what they want to do. do. That would be, that's what our future goes. <laughs> hey, I projects. mean, when you choose to pursue that, let me know. Because I also do real estate. In the oh, city. sweet. Yeah, yeah cool. And uh, to be honest, like where the... The innovation center is happening. Mm-hmm. Like I think once the center is like completely open, which will be like in May, uh, a lot of the houses around there are gonna starting to be like bought up and stuff. Oh. So I think that like if you can buy up one of those houses and mm-hmm. actually have like a hive there, mm-hmm. then that'd be awesome. Not only for the kids at the high school there and the middle school there, mm-hmm. but like for that community. Too. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now we do have an issue with. I think two or three abandoned homes behind our bee farm. Yeah. It's, I think I've been talking to the Detroit Land Bank Authority and they told us that the government bought them or something and they have a lien on these dilapidated homes mm-hmm. yeah. for like $35,000 each home. But it's like an eyesore. Is there any way around that where they can just dem- you know, demolish the home? Because it's like, it's like a, it poses as a, you know, as, as a... They're la- wait, are they land bank owned or government owned? I think they're government owned now. How, why like that's stupid yeah I'm thinking it's, it's, it's not even fixable it's not it's, no, a, it's, it's dilapidated not, it's not fixable at all so there's this huge issue where there this is happening like maybe five years ago right there was like these princes in Saudi Arabia these really rich like moguls in the like, Ukraine yeah. they were mm-hmm. buying thousands of these abandoned houses mm-hmm. and they just left them they didn't do shit with them mm-hmm. and they obviously became dilapidated and weren't taking care of them mm-hmm. and the city couldn't do anything about it because they were privately owned by these, these yeah. people. So now the city is like uh, like uh, demolishing a lot of these houses, right? right? But yeah. with a case like that, I have no clue. Yeah, because the only way they can hold on to that property if it's a, if it's a house that can be redeemed and re, you know fixed yeah. up, but yeah. these homes, 
They need to be demolished. Yeah. So <laughs> I thought maybe in real estate you can do some provisions around that. I'm gonna probably try to talk to somebody in the city of Detroit to have them removed or have them knocked down, and yeah. just ac- us acquiring the the property. We just want the yeah. land space yeah. so that we can further our mission. So. Cool man, cool guys. Thanks. <laughs> another, oh, another, this is oh, somebody, go. but it's it. always nice we just share with you. But yeah, um, bees. Another contributing factor, the, the declination of bees, or what causes bees to die off, is stress. Just like with humans, the number one killer is sometimes stress. Yeah. Bees work really hard. They work <laughs> really hard, yeah. and they need flowers like lavender, things that have give off a great scent of aromatherapy to relieve you from stress. Yeah. So another way where people can give back and help bees is by planting lavender. I plant great, great pollen sources that bees yeah. can have a variety of dandelions, boards, yeah. wildflowers, yeah. things like that, so yeah. they can pollinate from. So lavender is definitely one. We'll be adding a lavender garden to our bee farm to help relieve them from stress from all the hard work they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, I, you know, like, I feel like um, okay. humans have gotten away from, like, holistic, like, a means of taking care of themselves. Absolutely. And... Mm-hmm. Now it's great, like there are movements of people yeah. going yeah. back to that, but yeah, like planning, aromatherapy is like a huge thing, yeah, it's really yeah. important. Yeah. It's important to us, we use lavender in our teas and its fragrances to relieve us from stress. Yeah. And bees have a stronger sense, a nose sense than us, so yeah. when, they, when they sniff that and get a whiff of that, that definitely helps their day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so we want to keep our bees happy, yeah. healthy, <laughs> and vibrant. Cool, man. Well, let me know when there's a volunteer day. I'll come oh, up. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. We plan on doing like, it's so many things. We, we work, we have a partnership with many, uh, with Peace Street Parks, uh, Community Garden. We're building some other partnerships. Yeah. And we want to release a ladybug release very soon. Ladybugs are natural pesticides Besides. for your garden. So instead of having yeah. to spray them, just release ladybugs. And they eat all those annoying insects that eat up all your crops. Yeah. Ladybugs, roller yeah. polies. Yeah, all this stuff. Roller polies are good for your metals. Like, you got a lot of metals in your yeah. ground. Yeah. You know, and that's why it's like insecticides and pesticides, there is not just a threat to bees. They're a threat to all insects. insects. So now <laughs> we're in jeopardizing of losing our roller polies, our, our monarch butterflies, our ladybugs everything everything has a purpose and when you remove one it does a shift into the ecosystem so for everybody listening everybody watching uh if they want to get involved where can they go how can they get in contact with you guys Uh, well they can definitely visit our website at detroithives.com yeah check out our social media pages instagram facebook and twitter at detroit hives that's at detroit hives yeah all right, cool. Well, Nicole, Tim, I appreciate you guys sitting down and talking with me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks us. again. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for the next episode. <laughs> <laughs>